Immediately upon parking my car, shots rang out. You're a retired military. You worked for two presidents. You've done incredible things. I joined the Army with 12 gold teeth. With a mouthful of gold teeth, I, I look like a bad mix of Kevin Hart and Lil Wayne. You're currently working in clinical medicine. And I primarily supported the president, the vice president. And towards the end of my time at the White House Medical Unit in 2022, I was spending a lot of time with the First Lady. But you're also beginning to think like an entrepreneur. The ability to reinvent ourselves over and over again is a beautiful thing. That we don't have to be stuck in one thing. You're literally <laughs> Forrest Gump running around. I can't believe I'm here doing this. And it's, it seems just outside the context of normal. And it's like a dream, you would imagine. I want to hear some cool stories, man. Now, this is the story of a man who mastered the art of failing up. This is the odyssey of Dr. Bernard Tony. The sharp sting of a bullet, the shadows of the wrong crowd. Bernard's initial steps might have seemed like missteps to the rest of the world. But let us all be reminded to never touch a book by its cover. For Dr. Tony, every stumble was a step upwards in his unparalleled journey. Afghanistan's rough terrain served as a proving ground where he learned the essence of failing up, rising higher through the ranks of the military with each challenge. Imagine a young Bernard, adrift among faces that seemed to spell doom, but in the art of failing up, every setback, every wrong turn was but a springboard to the skies. And the raw echoes of the streets to the esteemed ranks of a U.S. Army officer and still further into the hallowed halls of the White House, where he would serve two presidents and their families as a White House medical officer, Dr. Tony's journey wasn't just about climbing. It was about lifting as he climbed, about turning fractured beginnings into one hell of a triumphant career. Having recently completed a master's degree in public health from the George Washington University and a doctor of medical science degree from the University of Lynchburg, it would appear that he's just getting started. And now, as a full-time clinical researcher for the National Institutes of Health, an adjunct professor of global health for the University of Lynchburg, as well as a board chair member of the Stepping Stones for Global Development, his wisdom, carved from decades of adversity, hard work, and raw determination, serves as a beacon for us all. Teaching us that in the face of failure, the decision to simply get back up and move in the right direction truly does define our destiny. Now embark with us on a journey through the remarkable life of Dr. Bernard Tony, a true testament to the transformative power of failing up. Quick one before this episode starts, if I could ask a favor from you. If you haven't yet already hit the subscribe or the follow button, wherever you're enjoying this podcast, be it YouTube, Spotify, or Apple, could you please just go ahead and hit that button in your app? It really helps this show more than I could possibly say. And thank you so much. Enjoy the conversation. Welcome to the Failing Up Podcast. It is such an honor to have you here today. Looking forward to digging in and learning so much about you. Let's start with your life and tell us about, a bit about what it was like growing up for you. Where did you grow up, et cetera? Yeah, thank you for having me. This is a pleasure to be your inaugural podcast for, for your show and for your members. I'll just start off with where I'm from and how I was raised and we'll go from there. But essentially, I was born in Detroit, Michigan. I don't claim to know much about Detroit because my parents moved to Atlanta, Georgia when I was three. And so that's where I was essentially raised. And so that's where most of my memories originate from. I come from a two parent household, working, working class family. My mother worked at a bank for many years and my father worked at Ford Motor Company, which he still works there. But they, again, they were working class family. I come from a family of five. I have an older sister and a younger sister. And we grew up in, I would say, a lower middle class household, particularly as, uh, as I got a little bit older, my mom dropped out of the workforce. And outside of that, I think we had a, a pretty normal upbringing. I'm still pretty close with both of my parents. Fantastic. Let's talk a bit about the journey from growing up at, at home to transitioning into young adulthood. I'd like to get in a bit to the story of your friend when you were younger, if that's okay with you. And talk a bit about that experience and how that from what I recall, that was a turning point for you. Can you explain, can you tell us that story and then explain the transition from that? Yeah, yeah, I could certainly go through that. I So I grew up in, in a situation in which I struggled academically throughout high school. I would say my struggles academically really started in middle school. So I started to really lose hope with respect to what my, what my options were as I got a little bit older. And so I found myself hanging out with the wrong crowd. But in that wrong crowd, I did have a very good friend, and his name was Ivan Gray. 
Ivan was, it, it was unlikely for us to graduate. And that's the way we perceived it. Like a graduation from high school was essentially like a graduation from an Ivy League school for many people today. So just making it to that point was a significant milestone. And as we were getting ready to graduate, I had graduated from a from alternative school. So I had already completed my graduation just a tad bit early. And I was already committed to joining the United States Army. My friend was had just gotten the notification that he would have the credits to graduate high school. And so we went out to a club and we partied really hard. And as we got ready to leave the club, we decided to go to a gas station and get some gas. As soon as we got there, it, things turned dramatically. As soon as I pulled up to a gas station in Atlanta, Georgia, I started to hear shots ring out. Bullets started to, started to hit my vehicle. I didn't know exactly what was going on. And once I started hearing the shots coming closer and hit my vehicle, I started to duck down and drive and try to get out of what would be considered the kill zone. As I was driving away, getting away from the gunfire, I noticed that my friend Ivan Gregg jumped back into the, into the passenger seat, and I was the driver. And he started to convulse. He leaned over. And I thought he was joking at the time, to be honest with you. But as he leaned over, I felt something wet dripping onto my hand and it was the blood coming from his mouth. I didn't know exactly what to do at that time. So I drove maybe a couple of minutes down the road. I can't quite remember. But as I parked my car and I pulled him out of the vehicle and I realized that he truly was he was shot. I didn't know where he was shot, or how bad the injuries were. So I called 911 and and that part of Atlanta it was a little bit difficult to try to get to get EMS to our location quickly. I think it was maybe one or two in the morning. It was pretty late. And as they tried to coach me over the phone to, to identify my location, they asked me where was he shot. I had no idea. He was wearing an all black shirt and a black leather jacket, and so it was. And it was dark. It was middle of the night. Had no idea how to communicate with EMS. And as I'm trying to figure all this out on the side of a dark street. I hear my friends calling out to me, don't let him go to sleep. That, that was their idea of me keeping him alive. I'm not sure how they thought I was going to do that, but that was the charge for me at the time. His eyes closed. And that's when I realized that, that he may not be with us anymore. Once he got into the ambulance, they started doing everything they can do to resuscitate him. And then that's when I realized that he passed. And that was a turning point for me because as I was on the ground trying to take care of him, trying to call in for EMS, call in for help. I realized that I was helpless. I didn't know what to do. And at some point, that helplessness turned into hopelessness. And that was how I started my adult life. I went from going from high school to trying to save a life unsuccessfully. And about three weeks later, I was in the United States Army as a private in basic training. Wow. Wow. That's so you're what, 18, 17, 18, 19 around that time? Or? We were all 17 at the time. 17. So 17 year old dear friend dies in your arms, essentially, and you'd watch that, witness that. I just can't even imagine what that's like at that age, having to process all of that and feeling that, that incredible sense of just hopelessness and not knowing the answers and having to endure that. It's profound. So how is, have you been in touch with his family since then? Or however, is that? Uh... No, actually, that's a good question. I, I went to his funeral and, I, and it was the last thing that I was able to do before I joined the military. Soon after I joined the military, I was, I was, I was shipped away. I went to Missouri for basic training and then on to California to study, to study a foreign language. And so my career just took off. The only touch point that I had with respect to that murder was I was brought back to the murder trial when I was still in my training as a soldier to testify. Okay. Wow. So three weeks later, a year in boot. And you're trying to process the death of your friend. I can't even, having gone through boot camp myself, that's, that's insane to think of. I just lost my friend and I got to focus, laser beam focus. And it's an environment that is unlike most environments. It's just, you're being yelled at, screamed at. You're having to block all pain out. That includes some emotional pain that you might have carried with you in your life into boot camp. How did you, what was that like, that, that those first few weeks of boot camp? How did you balance the thoughts of your friend and that experience? It's a traumatizing experience. I can only imagine a bit of PTSD in, that, in those moments during boot. How did what that look like those f- first few weeks in boot and all that? Yeah, you just mentioned something that I hadn't thought about, just how condensed that timeline was. I really hadn't thought about it in those terms that only about three weeks later I was being yelled at and all the things that that we associate with basic combat training. 
I don't know. I remember having to stay laser focused. I didn't have a whole lot of time. Everything was regulated. I think we were getting about five to six hours of sleep. Honestly, with every individual task or collective task that was put in front of me, that was the task at hand at the moment. Interestingly, I did not have a whole lot of time to process it. I think it was you go from one step to the next step without really having the opportunity to, to mourn, to have some sort of reconciliation. Unfortunately for me, I had to just continue to press on, and that's precisely what I did. I'm not entirely sure if I really had the opportunity to think about all of those things. I was, again, I was only 17 years old and, and trying to go from where I started in life to now in this new foreign space was really a lot to take on. And I think I was just focused on looking forward as opposed to looking in the rearview mirror. It's interesting. It makes me reflect a bit on it's such a tragedy. It's such a young life, 17 year old kid who was taken out of, of the ability to live his life and to see things through and and your life to move past that, you're able to compartmentalize. It's not unlike a war situation where you have a colleague, a fellow soldier die in the line of duty, but you have to keep moving on for the sake of the team and for the sake of others. And it seems to me that perhaps it's how you, you dealt with it in a, the most appropriate manner that you knew how at the time, right? You had to get on with your life, and but you carry it. We're talking about it now, post your army career. This is many decades, what, a couple, three decades later that we're having this conversation, both to reflect on that moment, but also to bring a sense of honor to him and his life and his family, and also to give some context as to some of the points that we're going to talk about today with regard to leadership and what it really means to be a leader, what it means to rise above what you would otherwise think yourself capable of doing. It sets the stage for a lot of what we're going to be discussing today. It sounds to me that's a worthy pursuit today in honor of Ivan. We can have this conversation and his family, where they may be. Let's talk a bit about your journey as a clinician and a leader. And, and what were some of the most significant obstacles or life difficulties that you faced that tested your resilience and determination? Yeah, honestly, I would say that segue from Ivan I think in many instances, I had a difficult time making the transition from being not just a civilian, but just a person that grew up in an environment that was scattered with access to illicit substances, drugs, violence, clearly. And then now all of a sudden being propped into this environment where there's extreme discipline. I think that was a significant transition and it took me quite some time. I did not transition very well from the outset to be candid with you. Many people who know me, they have photos of me in the past. I joined the army with 12 gold teeth. Not only did I have this checkered past, but I didn't look like everyone else around me. So that I just couldn't escape that. And so one of the interesting things is as I tried to, as you, in your words, compartmentalize a lot of that, I couldn't get away from it. And one of the, one of the points that I remember vividly was having to go back to the murder trial. The Supreme, the Supreme Court of Georgia ended up seeing, or Georgia State Supreme Court ended up looking at this case. And at some point I was brought back to testify for the murder trial itself. When I came back to my training, that was the question. Why did detectives from Atlanta, Georgia come and pick this guy up? He has 12 gold teeth. Everything speaks to, I am not a soldier. Like I'm not consistent with the army. And so just having that, that cloud over me and having the leaders that I had over me at the time look at me in a different way made it a significant challenge for me to want to stay in the military. It made it very difficult for me to want to, to excel. And so the, for those first few years, I did very poorly. I went to, to study Russian, and I remember opening my mouth to speak and everyone saying, what kind of accident did you get into to have all these gold teeth? And so I intentionally failed out of that program. But that wasn't the army wasn't done with me. So they said, listen, you're going to retrain and they retrained me as a medic. And so that was the the infancy of my career in medicine, if you will, because I had to retrain into some military occupational skill. And that's what I did. I retrained as a medic and I did a, an additional some additional training as a mental health specialist. And so that was actually helpful for me as well to be able to learn about psychological disorders, but also recognize that I may have some challenges as well. And that was the start. I did a lot of things after that. I went on to work with U.S. Army Special Forces as a French cryptologic linguist. But every opportunity that I had, I found myself working with the Special Forces medics in Afghanistan or going to paramedic school at night. I always had this desire 
to, uh, to be a clinician of some sort, to be able to put hands on patients and save lives. And even though in the first, I would say, seven years of my military career, that wasn't always my primary focus, I made it my focus, even as a civilian. Our audience is both those who are, have worked in clinical medicine, those who have been in the military, those who have not been in the military. And I want to try to transition or bridge that, that gap. But this is, this, these are concepts that transcend career paths. So not just medicine, not just being in the military. Let's back up a bit about your transition into the military. How, do you think that the military perhaps was that the, the stopgap, the, the backstop to your life? If you didn't have the military, how else could you potentially have found your way for our listeners who, are, who would never join the military for whatever reason, be it a very personal reason, or it just isn't something that they're interested in doing? How could a young person starting out find a similar backstop without necessarily having to join the military? What are your thoughts on that? That is a great question. To your point, only about 1%, actually less than 1% of U.S. citizens actually serve in the United States military. So we're talking about an extreme minority statistically. And I like the way you phrase that was my backstop because had I not joined the military, I think dead or in jail or of the were my options. Most of the people that I knew growing up, to include Ivan and many others, did not make it out of my neighborhood. And, and many people who did make it out of the neighborhood just didn't fare well in life. I think what the military allowed for me in a very formal way, and I think that you can find this in many different spaces, whether it's in, at the university level, whether it's within your community with men's groups or, or what have you, I think finding mentors that you can tether yourself to as soon as, or as soon as possible, as early as possible in life and as frequently as possible was the key. Because let's be clear, the military didn't love me as much as I needed it at the time, but there were some very instrumental and key leaders early on in my career that would not allow me to fail. And so that, that leadership, that personal investment in humans and people is something that we can find in many different spaces. I just think that we have to, one, seek it out, and two, be willing to accept that mentorship. Because early on, I'll be honest with you, I didn't see... I didn't see in myself what other people saw in me, put it that way. And so I wasn't very receptive, honestly, to a lot of the assistance and help early on. So I think for listeners that haven't been in the military, I think the 99%, it's, it's fostering this idea of lifting as you climb. And now in my life, what I do is I try to reach deeply into the pool of people who, who I resonate with and who I think need some assistance or some help. And I try to lend them a helping, a, help, a helping hand and give them a leg up because that's exactly what I needed. And many of these people are not in the military. Oftentimes they're civilians and students. And I mentor people from the entire spectrum, not just in the United States, but even abroad. So I think just being willing and able to do that is very key. That's brilliant. Yeah, I love that. I love that answer. <clears throat> let's talk a bit about, let's play a game here. Let's pretend that I'm a young kid and tell me... How am I, as a 15, 16-year-old, going to reach out to mentors without embarrassing myself? And how high should I reach as a 15-year-old? Should I, obviously, the first step would be my peers, right? That's where I get my immediate answers. I'm a more comfortable with them. But how do I reach out to somebody that I aspire to be, perhaps, or seems impossible? How do I do that? T talk to me as a 15-year-old. Yeah. How do I do that? Yeah. Great question. I, that level of confidence, I didn't have that at 15. The first thing I will say is don't get gold teeth because I think that changes <laughs> the conversation quickly. <laughs> yeah. And it makes it much more difficult. I think that's a barrier to entry for mentorship. I would say there's so many opportunities. When I was growing up, I saw a lot of people who who were engaged in so many different activities. I was never an athlete, but I felt like the athletes that I was in school with had that in their coaches. I was never an academic or a student that did well, but I remember this organization called Future Black Leaders of America. I think it was FBLA. And they had within the, within the teaching staff people who would assist them in many ways. We had JRTC. And those, and those types of programs that exist in many schools are, a, are an avenue to find that mentorship. I think really it's putting yourself in a position to where it is okay. If I can, make, if I can clarify that point, most of the people that I spent a lot of time with were not going anywhere fast. The people who were engaged in some sort of collective activity, some sort of group activity, some sort of team sport, it was okay to speak to your coaches. It was 
okay to speak to your teachers and get that assistance. And so if you can find yourself in a group where socially it's acceptable, then oftentimes I think that's what young people need. They need to be in an environment that enables them to reach out and ask for that assistance. And I think it takes a little, it takes a little bit of courage to do that, but I think that's necessary. That's great. Yeah, that's a great answer for the young person. Let's flip the, the script a bit and talk about, okay, I'm an executive. I've achieved great success in my career. And you, and I, let's say, I am dealing with a bit of imposter syndrome. That, that term gets thrown around quite a bit these days. And it seems a bit cliche to talk about at times, but it's a real thing. And so let's pretend like I'm that executive and I'm afraid to talk with some of the people in my organization, be it someone who's equal, equally ranked or higher, let's say it's higher ranked. And I, I need mentorship. I need a way through and I'm not finding it for whatever reason. Maybe I'm blind. Maybe I just, I'm not aware, but, I, but I'm just aware enough to where it's like, okay, I need some help. How do I approach that person of higher rank and perhaps even equal or lower rank? What are your suggestions there? Yes, great Great question. I was always told two things. They were competing when I was a young officer in the military. For your listeners, that these are very senior people in the military who have advanced through the ranks. I was one at one point. I was told it gets lonely at the top, and in many cases, it does. It, it does get lonely at the top. Your pool of people that you can be vulnerable with becomes very small. It shrinks significantly. But in that same breath, though, one thing that I was always told as a very young officer and leader being groomed to lead organizations was to to remember two things. One, who am I mentoring? And two, who's mentoring me? And if you can't answer both of those questions at any given moment of your career, then there's something wrong. And even the most senior people that I've ever had the benefit of, of talking to and learning from, I'm thinking of Colin Powell, may he rest in peace. He had mentors. What, who mentors the secretary, a secretary of state, national security advisor, four-star general, all those things, all those resume bullet points, who mentors that guy? And without, without going into granular detail, he had mentors. And so I think mm-hmm. seeking that out, irrespective of where you are in the pecking order, even the president has mentors. And that's oftentimes in, in a form of their cabinet members and advisors. Mm-hmm. So I think that in a formal way, a lot of times we can have that in a very structured way. Let's say if you work for the government or a company and someone evaluates you, oftentimes that is someone who can be a mentor. You have that, that pathway to be able to reach out to them and is very regulated. But I think we should always have someone that can mentor us for different aspects of our life, spiritual mentors, mm-hmm. physical mentors. I have mentors that sometimes the parenting advice didn't come from, from family members. It came from my secretary at some point because she was just so good with her children. And I was thinking, wow, if, if, I can have, if my children can be like hers, I'll, that would be success. So I think looking, looking for mentorship in the unlikeliest of sources is one of the things that, that I would consider. But I would also make use of those formal mentorship relationships as well. Yeah, that's great. Yeah, it brings to mind Atul Gawande. He's a heart trained surgeon, very renowned surgeon, extremely published. He's just an incredible guy. He's a god among gods in medicine, as you well know. And at the height of his career, he seemed that he was at a place of being stagnant in the OR and uh, had reached the peak and was thinking, how do I up my game? And so he hired a coach, Dr. Osteen, to come in and help him improve his skill set and kind of the ballet of the movement within a surgical suite. How do you move your arms and your instruments in a more effective way? And having that, that, uh, that person in the OR with him helped him level up his game. So that's super cool. With regard to mentorship, looking at those that you mentioned this earlier, mentorship from anywhere in any context within your prof- your professional or your personal life. It could come from the people that work for you, right? So there's, the, there's these feedback loops that you can get. There's even surveys that you can do to measure your performance. Blinded, meaning you send a performance rating to the people that work for you, and they give you that feedback, honest feedback. It's blinded in the sense that you don't know who it's coming from. Therefore, it can be more real, and you get real-time feedback on, okay, these are some weak spots that I just wasn't aware of. That kind of 360-degree feedback can be super helpful, not just in the professional setting, but in your personal setting. We get that in our marriages, our relationships, partnerships. We, you want that kind of feedback continuously to know how you're doing, how you can improve and make life better for, for others and yourself. 
So I appreciate that answer quite a bit. Let's talk a bit about how do you personally overcome those challenges and setbacks in your career and then turn them into stepping stones for success? What strategies or mindset shifts do you find most effective? Yeah, thank you for the question. I think for me, it's funny that you mentioned stepping stones because honestly, I consider myself to be standing on the shoulders of every single person that's been there for me in my career. They were my stepping stones. And so I would say build that 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 safety net of people who are going to support you when you fall because you will. Uh, Most of the decisions that I've made in my career were often not exclusively my own. Even the choice of going to PA school, I had a great mentor, Eric Arnold, who knew nothing about medicine. He's a helicopter pilot by training. And so he knew that that I had something within my within my abilities to be able to do the things that I wanted to do. I didn't have the confidence. He gave me that confidence. So I would say finding those people who are going to be your champions, the people who are going to give you the straight feedback and tell you, you know, where you're missing things and to give you the unvarnished truth. Those were those were my supports and buffers that I needed to be able to make it in my career. My perspective as far as mentality in the frame of mind was that everything's temporary. Everyone has a different frame of reference. My frame of reference was I'm not being shot at, at least at some points in my career, I wasn't being shot at, (laughs) but that's what I will tell myself. I had already survived a drive-by shoot in Atlanta, Georgia. I had already survived three combat tours to Afghanistan. So whatever I was dealing with on a Monday, it it wasn't that bad. I was able to say that I'm not being shot at. And that was my frame of reference for just about everything. And, and I will tell that to the people that I work with. And even though they don't have any remote experience with being, being shot at by weapons, they would say that that resonates. It's, maybe it's not as urgent as I think it is. And I was able to recenter myself when I failed at a task, when I didn't mm-hmm. perform as, as good as I hoped to have performed, when I didn't get the ratings that I wanted on my evaluation, when the mission didn't work out the way I thought or hoped that it would. I wasn't being shot at and I had another opportunity to get back in the ring. And so that was my focus. And that's how I internally gave myself some drive and perseverance to be resilient. But in the same breath, on the flip side of the same coin, I made sure I had those supports and buffers from people all around me from different Mm -hmm. backgrounds and different disciplines at different levels in their career, senior officers and peers alike that were able to help help me keep going. Wow. Yeah, that's brilliant. I love that answer. Yeah, the ability to kind of understand and contextualize the level of stress that we have to deal with on the daily in our workspace and at home. And yeah, what a great litmus to be able to measure it against the rigors of combat. Yeah, that's really well said. And I can definitely vibe with that. I understand that level of difference between the problems at hand and real problems that our veterans, our friends and colleagues and ourselves have been in the midst of. That's it's great. And going back even further to the beginning of your answer, the idea of failure, right? The idea of it's okay to fail. It's expected in my line of work. And you mentioned a pilot buddy in the airline industry, the aviation industry, they've mitigated failures. They have checklists. They've mitigated those failures to the greatest degree possible, but still as humans, if we're human, we are prone to failure, which is a beautiful part of being human, that we have the ability to make great decisions and sometimes some not so great decisions and fail ourselves and others. So let's talk about that. Within the realm of healthcare quality and safety, there's this idea of just being able to mitigate the failures that can move through systems. Let's take that concept, the idea of the Swiss cheese model, James Reason's Swiss cheese model, where you've got a latent error that's sitting in wait. It can happen. It hasn't happened because you have various checkpoints in place to prevent it from happening. But let's say the holes in the cheese line up perfectly and that latent air gets through to the end, right? And it becomes a catastrophe at the end of that. Let's take that concept, which is ingrained in aviation and healthcare and whatnot. And let's talk about that for the sake of everyone outside those industries. And let's talk about that in the context of life, right? The things that that the Swiss cheese model in life for a young person moving along and they can't see the latent errors that they're about to, the things that they're about to do, and how can they block those holes from lining up in their life? Yeah, no, I, I totally get it. Two things I will say is the Swiss cheese model is something that that I've been able to see in my career in medicine when something goes wrong, and we are, we're able to go back and what we do is an after action review and say, how did we 
how did that happen? And we can see that this person didn't talk to that person and no one checked this gauge and et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. And it's just a perfect storm. We call it Murphy's Law in a lot of ways. Yeah. I would say you can't engineer your way out of every single problem like the aviation community loves to do. We still have aviation mishaps and failure is going to be an element of life no matter what. So I am I'm very okay with talking with you about my failures and how they lined up in succession. And oftentimes there wasn't a whole lot that I've could that I could have done to mitigate those failures. But what I would say for that sort of Swiss cheese analogy, where all those holes line up, is I would say that as long as you can try to plan as much as you possibly can to be intentional and deliberate about what are you going to do when bad things happen, because they will. What does a contingency look like for you? When your contingency fails, like it oftentimes will, what does your emergency backstop look like for you? And try to have different layers of, of buffers and support because there will be some situations that are just inevitable. And I can tell you that for myself, that most of my failures, which I have many, many of the times that there was not a whole lot that I could have, that I could have done to mitigate those, those failures, but they were learning opportunities. And I take those learning opportunities with me and try to impart that on other people every single day. I said that kind of answered both questions, the personal and the professional side. Let's go back to the game we were playing earlier and talk to a young person. They're starting out in life and they are about to make some grievous errors. They can't really see that it's a latent error, right? Let's say they're involved in, in, in a group of people that is less than optimal for their future outcomes. Mm-hmm. How do you help that young person recognize those, those potential pitfalls early on? Like, how do they, and what do they do about those? Because there's a solidarity amongst young people. There's in-group and out-group, right? It's, it plays very strong. And it's hard for them to decipher what's right from what's, what's wrong in the context of those groups. They just want to go along. They want to be accepted. How do you, what would your instruction be to a young person who's in that place making those decisions? And how do they, how they step around that? How do they navigate those waters, those treacherous waters? Yeah, I'd never listened to anything that my parents told me. <laughs> Let's just be clear. They were old. I'm old now relative to my kids. And so I, I will tell you that that I live by this philosophy that I would rather see a sermon than hear a sermon any day, meaning that modeling is key, particularly with, I would even say, not even just young people, but even relative young people that are in college that are making sometimes catastrophic errors or even sometimes people later on in life. It's not our wisdom sometimes doesn't present itself as timely as we would like for it to. But I, I would try to model. And that's generally what I what I hope to do in my life is try to be a model for people around me. Telling them things really doesn't help. I can't remember many of the things that a lot of folks, come on. I think about the person who gave a talk at your assemblies at school. Do you remember anything they said? I don't. Not a word. Not a word. <laughs> Not a word. And so who was that guy? I can't remember. But yeah. I remember the behaviors of people. Mm. I remember the person that I wanted to be like for whatever reason. And so if we can be those positive models in all of these settings, in the universities, in the high schools, in the military, people who are not in those settings and just in the communities, I think modeling that behavior and being accessible for people to see that modeling is key. I don't think my words of wisdom really hold as much weight, to be honest with you. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that's great. Yeah, absolutely correct. Yeah. Seeing it in action and then trying it on for yourself, right? So testing that out. So if a young person were to see you doing that and they try it out in their context and they're met with some consternation or they're met with some resistance, their in-group is, what are you doing, man? That's so uncool. And having the determination and the, and the self-pride and the just courage to be the right, do the right thing, be the right person in that context is the answer. That's hard to do. It is so hard to muster that. And that the same can be said for anyone in any context, no matter where you are, if you're just starting out or if you're highly successful, there's still in-groups, even at the highest echelons of leadership. Yeah, I, as I was answering that question, I was thinking about even when I first joined the army, I was a very young soldier. I was still 17. So let's be clear, I was still a kid in a lot of ways. We still had those in groups. We still had the guys and girls that wanted to be cool. And we were in a lot of ways still like an extension of high school yeah. at that age. 
But I do remember the first black officer, and it took me almost a year and a half to see a black officer in the Army. His name was Clyde Hill. He was a nurse by profession, and he was my company commander for people who don't know. It's a person who leads about 200 or so soldiers. And uh, I remember thinking, wow, seeing that rank on his hat, seeing that, that rank on his shoulders, it deep inside of me, I said, that's possible. And he had no idea that he had that impact on me at the time. But I remember seeing those captain's bars stand in front of that formation and thinking, I've never seen a black person wearing that rank and leading this type of organization and thinking, if he can do it, maybe I can do it. Those types of thoughts. And ironically, about 15 years later, I found myself in a sauna and I'm sitting next to Clyde Hill. At that time, he had progressed really? through the ranks and he was a lieutenant <laughs> colonel. He, he, he was a much more senior and we actually ended up going to church together in Hawaii. So um, a, a lot of full circle experiences. But yeah, that modeling, he had no idea what he was wow. doing for me at the moment. But just wow. being exceptional made me mm-hmm. realize that I had the potential to be exceptional as well. That's incredible. <laughs> that is years. so awesome. Wow. Wow. And for him to look back on that moment and remember that moment and have a moment of pride in himself. Yeah, it paid off. How vocal were you to him to let him know that, hey, this is, if you recall, did you like bring that, bring him back to that moment? That this is the kind of impact you? Great. Absolutely. And we're sitting in a sauna. This is maybe we're naked. This is weird, but <laughs> but we're sitting in a sauna. We had shorts on. And I said, and I looked at him. I recognized him right away. He was older, 15, yeah. 16 years older, but I yeah. recognized him. And I said, yeah. were you, are, is your name Clyde Hill? He's like, yeah, my, huh. I'm Clyde. And I said, I was a private in the army when you were a captain. And, and I said, there's a couple things he did for me. One, he showed me what exceptionalism looked like in real time. Two, he was, he signed my orders for me to go be a paratrooper. So he was the, my commander. So he had to sign off on me going to jump school and jump out of airplanes for the rest of my military career. But I let him know the impact that he had on me. And what was so profound was he had no idea who I was. Wow. And that is, and that is the level of impact that he probably made on dozens, scores yeah. of people yeah. just yeah. like me and just by modeling, just by being exceptional. And yeah, we had that conversation and moving forward, we ended up going to the same church. It was super weird. But yeah, we ended up going to the same church in Hawaii, Honolulu. And yeah, I just have a lot of full circle sort of experiences where I was able to see people early on in their career as young leaders. And then people, the same leaders removed, 10 years removed and what mm-hmm. they've done for me. And so I can count, mm-hmm. geez, I can name at least five or five to seven people at, mm-hmm. right now that have made that kind of impact on me. Pretty significant. That's awesome. Wow. That's amazing. That is so cool. Would you encourage young people to join the military? This sounds like a promotional video at this point. <laughs> be all that you can be. <laughs> be all um, that you can be. That's right. Um, uh, would yeah, you encourage my podcast someone? voice? Be all that you can be. <laughs> I would say. I would say this. I would say that what the military has done for me is not necessarily reproducible for everyone. I think different people are in different stages of their life. For me, it's exactly what I needed. Okay. Full mm-hmm. stop. It's exactly what I needed. For many others, maybe not so much. And I I think having those mentors in place to be able to say, have you considered this path? Have you considered going Mm -hmm. to school? Have you considered a trade? Have you considered all this this range of options? I think is very key. I didn't have that. So not only did I not have a mentor to help guide me, but realistically, if I were to be honest with myself, I really had no other options anyway. So for me, it made sense. But for someone else... Maybe we need that doctor in the workforce as soon as possible. And and the detour to the military might be a disservice to the patients that person might help out one day. Mm -hmm. Or maybe we need someone who goes in in their community organizer or or they go into political science and want to be a politician early on and, and help their communities. I think maybe that type of service might be much more suitable. So I think that the military is a pathway. I think it's honorable. I think, again, there's less than 1% that actually serve. And I sleep well at night because of those men and women who serve. But I think it's a personal decision. And I think that decision is something that has to be weighted against every other opportunity that a person has at that moment in their life. Yeah, no, that's well said. I agree with that assessment. Absolutely. Yeah, it worked out for me, too, for the same reasons. I have no regret. I'm very grateful to have joined the military and spent a number of years in the military. But my kids, my son, Spencer, my daughter, Sierra, chose not to do the military and they found their way in life without it in very unique ways, profoundly impactful ways that I would never suspect they could have gone down the traditional, more traditional. You and I are both a bit older, so 
we went down that traditional pathway where it's okay, go to school, get an education, and there's a job that awaits out past that, that the rigors of that, whatever that thing is, that gauntlet that you set for yourself, be it school, be it joining the military, become a Navy SEAL, be it any sort of special forces, there's like a gauntlet that you lay down for yourself. And you follow that path, you come out the other end, and there's good things that await because of that. But there's a lot of young people nowadays who are just like, no, resistant to that. They're going to create their own path. And rightfully, they should think for themselves, learn to think for themselves, and do things that are outside the context of what you and I have done. And we should help them in that regard and champion them. And that for my son, for example, he grew up a musician. And I encourage that sometimes to the detriment of no other options because he was very talented. And he had a moment in his life, in his young life, about 18, 19, where his dad I'm on this path and I'm scared to death now of what awaits me out past being a musician. And he was terrified to the degree that he's, I don't think I can do this. I think this is a bad move. I should not do this. This is not the smart move. And we had a heart to heart about that. And it was very difficult for him. And he also, thank goodness, had a technical expertise. He was a, he could write code. And so he went down this path of leaving what he had set up, up for himself as a musician for a number of years and went down this path of becoming a, a, a software engineer, working for a big company, and ultimately coming back to music and creating a company, combining both his love of music and his technical expertise. My daughter, Sierra, went down this path of, she got to the point in her life where she is now a personal trainer and runs a business doing overseas work, running these amazing group efforts for fitness and movement and these retreats called Movement Maker Retreats. And these are things that my, I would have never imagined for my kids. And it's so surprising and so beautiful to see that unfolding because they went the opposite path from their dad. It was brilliant to see. And I try to encourage as much as possible. You don't have to be like me. You don't have to do the things that I do. And it doesn't require an education to do great things in life. It does require knowledge and wisdom and deep knowledge and deep expertise. But it doesn't necessarily require a, a formal education it doesn't require a university diploma. So obviously, there's things that do require that, law and medicine, of course. But I would encourage young people in their lives, that's not necessarily the way through all the time. For platforms like LinkedIn, people with professional degrees by and large, but there's a whole other world out there of young people who um, are bucking that system and saying, no, um, I can do something quite different. Let's talk a bit about those young people, or not so necessarily young, like people who are trying to Maybe they've gone down the traditional path and they're done with it. They're just like, I've got to transition out of this. I want to do something else. I want to be an entrepreneur. I want to build my own thing. I'm tired of working for others. And not to say that there's anything wrong with working for others. In fact, all of medicine is built on that, that, that construct of serving, right? Serving the needs of others to the degree of giving, one's, giving up oneself, sometimes to a burnout level, which isn't healthy. But there's this idea of moving outside the construct of serving others, and building something to one's own self, a, a entrepreneurial endeavor where you're going to be hiring other people and, uh, and doing something outside, way outside the norm. Let's talk about that, both for young people and, uh, and older people, people like our age who've done career, traditional careers and want to branch out of that. What does that look like? You and I vibe with that right now. We've done tr traditional careers. You're a retired military. You worked for two presidents. You've done incredible things. And now here you are on the back end of that and you're thinking, okay, what exists now? You're currently working in clinical medicine, but you're also beginning to think like an entrepreneur. What does that feel like? Talk to us a bit about that transition, what you hope it will come to, and try to make it contextual enough to help the young person and help the other and people like us who are older and trying to do something new and recreate ourselves. Yeah, the, these are concepts that, that many people struggle with. And I certainly, I, I champion people to do whatever it is they can do to make an impact. And the way I've, in my life, I've categorized life in thirds, right? The first third, you're learning everything that you need to know to, to do the thing, whatever that is. The second third, you're employing that. Now you're practicing medicine or whatever it is. And the third third, you're figuring out ways to give it all back, right? And so that's where I am in my life. Not to say that I'm in my third, but I'm moving towards that direction where now I'm thinking, how do I make an impact on people beyond the four walls of a clinical exam room? What does that look like? In, in a lot of ways, that does take an entrepreneurial spirit or a very unorthodox approach, if you will. I can certainly continue to practice medicine. I currently work at the National Institutes of Health. It's a great organization. I have a great team. 
a lot of times I'm, I gravitate towards want to do something more. What that looks like for me is I do a lot of speaking engagements. I do a lot of mentoring. I get, I, I monetize that. And I think that we should all figure out a way to monetize that because that gives you the propellant, if you will, to do more, to reach a larger audience. So I would say for people who are young, go wherever your azimuth is taking you. So many people, I think as you were talking about your kids, I was thinking your son is probably a great musician and probably a great coder. And he Mm -hmm. excels and thrives in that space. And he's probably brilliant in that space. Maybe he would have been just an average soldier or lower than average soldier. I don't know that to be true, but I see that oftentimes when we're pushed in one direction or another. A better example is this. When I was growing up, everyone said, you need to have a degree, whatever that meant. You need to go to college, get a degree and get a good job. And so that was the recipe for success. Maybe this person would have been a much better tradesman and have been able. What happens when you take the paintbrush out of the artist's hand and say, now I want you to go see patients. Now this person is a mediocre doctor when they could have been a great artist. I think that we should look at people's talents, skills and attributes, and they should play to that, whatever that is. To the point of being in the military, I think they are the guardians for people to be able to have the freedom to do that, right? And I think what we have right now is a great democratic approach where we have a, a all-volunteer military where people can go in and serve their country and protect and defend our nation, which then enables people like your son and daughter mm-hmm. to thrive in whatever space that they thrive in. And so I mm-hmm. think that's where I would, that's how I would advise the younger person, but even the older person, which I see that quite a bit too. As you well know, I just just finished a master of public health degree. And the range of students in my program went from 23, 24 year old recent undergraduates all the way up to people in their fifties and sixties, which driving that. And I think that people, they want to make, they want to have an impact. They want to do more. And what that looks like is very different for all of us. So my recommendation is, is look at what gives you the motivation to wake up every single day. If, if you can find you know, that, that thing where I had a good friend at the White House who loved it so much, he said, Tony, I can do this for free. That's how much he loved it. He loved traveling around with the president. Yeah. He said, they don't even have to pay me. I'll do this for free. <laughs> if you can find that love, whatever that is, that's where you need to be. That's where you're going to be exceptional and not just average. And I think we have to relook at, at the advice and, and guidance that we give folks to say, this is what success looks like. Maybe for some people, but not for all. And so, again, I I hearken back to what happens when you take the paintbrush out of the painter's hands and you give Mm -hmm. them a a different trade and say, now go do this. What do you have at the other end of that? And so we end up doing that as a society pretty often. Mm Mm-hmm. Yeah, yeah. It's unfortunate that we tend to push people into and to pigeonhole them in ways that we see their life unfolding when, in fact, it isn't the way. And it's interesting to also note that People can live multiple lives. And the idea of a young person thinking, okay, I've got my whole life ahead of me. I have to pick one thing that I need to do to be able to feed myself and potentially feed a family. That, that idea, because we're living longer, because we're living into our 90s, even so much as 100, 110 years of age, that's enough to have three, four careers. And that's becoming much more popular now. And the ability to re- reinvent ourselves over and over again is a beautiful thing that we don't have to be stuck in one thing. So a young person, teens, 20s, 30s, where they're like, man, I can't believe I went to law school. I spent four years undergrad, three years in grad school, and I hate my job. I hate being a lawyer. And that's it. That's the end. I got to be a lawyer now because I've spent $300,000 on student loans and I got to stick it out. That's a tough place to be, but that person could potentially reinvent themselves, use that law degree in some of the capacity or do something else altogether. It's hard to make that transition when you have a $300,000 note over your head, but it's still possible in finding that way. Same thing with doctors, nurses that are burnt out, especially having gone through the rigors of COVID. They're at the other end of that and they're just, they're left with this feeling of emptiness. I went through all that school and I've come out the other end of this and I'm disheartened to see where this is, where this went. And it's discouraging to see and it's unfortunate. It saddens me to see those clinicians who were at one time quite brilliant and capable of making incredible changes in the lives of others that their hope and their passion for medicine was stomped on because of the difficulties inherent to caring for patients beyond their capacity. So the idea of reinvention is really a passion of mine and something that I've thought about deeply. And I've spent time reinventing myself in different ways. This podcast is even an extension of that. I don't know where it's going. 
But the, I love having conversations like this with people in, in life, sitting on a bus or a plane or what have you. And I could bring these concepts and these conversations to the world through something as simple as just the internet. And, uh, and whether this yields any sort of payment is irrelevant. It's the beauty and the joy of just sitting down and having a heart to heart with somebody like yourself has just been phenomenal. And I hope to do more of this. Piggybacking off of that last concept, the last thing we just discussed regarding burnout. Let's talk a little bit about that, what that looks like, not just in the context of healthcare, but in general, how do we deal with that? I think all of us have heard our, the last we want to hear of, well, just do some yoga and just meditate in the moment. And as the world crashes around you, here's your, let's just have a kumbaya. And anyway, get back to work. You got another 16 hours to do here right. and you're going to be on call for three more days. So, <laughs> let's talk about real answers. What does that look like? I think for me personally, it goes back to organizations and what can they set up other than these kumbaya remedies? How do organizations fix themselves? There's so two questions. Number one, how do organizations fix themselves to where burnout is a thing of the past? And number two, how does the individual mitigate that? I think it's a two-pronged approach. I think that it falls on, on the backs of organizations. And then there's also some personal responsibility with the, the professional, be they a doctor, nurse, lawyer, tech guru, whatever. How, what's the way through? It's a complicated answer, but what do you... It is a complicated, it's a very complicated question, and I appreciate the question. I recently just spoke to a chief people officer at a major hospital system here in Maryland, and her number one concern was the burnout of her workforce. Her nurses were exhausted. And again, this is specific to healthcare, but it's true across any multiple different sectors, multiple different domains. But using that as a use case... Her concern was really, how do we affect this burnout? And to your question, that was one of the things that, that she was most concerned with. I'll tell you that in my experience, organizations that are agile and are receptive to the pulse of their organization, meaning that they are they're asking them the questions, what can we do to make that organization better? And being receptive to that feedback is key. In this C-suite executive's experience, she, she surveyed her workforce and many of them wanted things that, that were doable. They wanted flexible, they wanted flexible work schedules in many cases that were very rigid before. They wanted the ability to telework. They wanted, they wanted many things that would actually drive efficiencies higher for a, use an example of the back office functions where, where a lot of that stuff you can automate, you can give people a technology package, you can reduce their commuting time by one hour every single day, et cetera. And that can make people more efficient, but it also makes people more flexible to take care of their families. I think what organizations should try to do is to make sure that they're receptive and listening to their, to their employees on a regular basis. We often feel like if no news is good news, if no one's outwardly complaining, then everything must be okay. And that's precisely not the case. And so what I've seen in my career is in the military, we would do sensing sessions. And so that would give people an opportunity. A what session? Ex a, se that? a sensing a sensing session? Sensing. Okay, sensing. Sensing session. session, yeah. Okay. It would give people an opportunity to, to express their grievances, complaints, concerns with the organization as it relates to their, to their personal lives. Mm -hmm. But it would remove the leader outside of the element. So the leader wouldn't be in the room. There was anonymity in that. And so different organizations would do that in different ways. The executive that I was talking about surveyed her organization. So that was one way of doing it. But nonetheless, the uh, the take home point is you got to know what questions to ask um, and you got to ask the questions. You have to figure out where there's problems, even when they don't readily present themselves. Workforce burnout is definitely a concern for a lot of different organizations. And you got to know the health of your organization. The only way to there's a saying that goes, the only thing that you can manage is what you measure. And if you're measuring the capacity for people, the, the emotions, the things that make people happy or unhappy, if you can measure that in some meaningful way, you can manage that. But it takes mm -hmm. leaders that are involved with ensuring that they have healthy organizations to be able to do that. On a personal level, I think it's also le leading from your seat, being able to talk to your supervisors and your leadership to say, these are the constraints that I have to be able to be an effective employee for you. These are the, I always tell people not to bring a problem without bringing solutions. 
but mm-hmm. have enough courage to bring to your leadership. These are the things that I need to do to be successful in my personal life, but mm-hmm. also be extremely successful within an organization mm-hmm. and finding ways to lead from bottom up. At the same time, while organizations are looking at systems and policies and regulatory practices to be able to, to improve the health of their organizations. A lot of that is very difficult to do. But I think, again, you can only manage what you measure. And leaders have to measure that as regularly and as, as often as they can. No, that's great. Yeah, it's a cheap solution, right? Just getting your finger on the pulse is very simple to do. A survey can really give you insights. And then you're able to figure it out in terms of what do our resources allow and trying to feather in the best solutions using Pareto's law. What are the three things out of this list of 10 are rising to the top? The three things that are less, least expensive, that won't implode the organization from a financial standpoint that we can actually deploy um, and relatively quickly. What are the things that we can solve immediately that are super simple and free? And then beyond that, what can we put some resources into to really make a difference? Not really well said. I agree with those answers. Yeah, it's, there's no easy way through with that. It's such a huge problem. And it seems that it's, it, and it's hard. We think in, in terms of silos, when you're in an organization, it's hard to see outside the context of that organization. The leadership is very unique to that organization. It's hard to gain insight from outside the, the four walls of your organization and learning from others. So looking not only within, but outside, what are solutions that others are using, I think is super important to bring along to. And hiring, if you've got the money and the resources to do it, hiring organizations Mm -hmm. that really have a good idea on how to deal with that problem. Not just, again, not to discount meditation and not to discount the kumbaya. Everyone gets a yoga mat. (laughs) Yeah. And there's companies out there that are very good at actually building that kind of resiliency and we should listen to those, that wisdom. There's certainly a lot there. So not, I'm not discounting that at all. It's just that it's not a one-stop shop and it shouldn't be the end all be all. It should be part of a multi-pronged approach to helping burn out an organization. And just, yeah, it goes back to the basics of being a good human being, being kind to others is so important. We're all stressed out. There's no reason to be angry to the point of disparaging others and yelling and screaming. That's when an organization has completely failed. And that goes back to the individual. Yeah, I think I think we're we're just in a complex time, right? So like our, there's a there was a CEO of, of a major hospital system in California. And I won't put her name in the podcast, but there's a major CEO over in California who spoke about the fact that during the pandemic, she was able to to change the, the structure of the organization. Rents on buildings are very expensive. She talked about being able to get rid of a lot of those buildings and, again, deploy technology solutions to people to be able to work from home. That increased the bottom line. That made people more efficient. That that also decreased the overhead of paying for rents on, on buildings to house all these people who would normally drive to the campus and work. The numbers worked out great. The flip side of the same coin is we're also dealing with the loneliness epidemic, as the Surgeon General will say. Yep. And what's happening to your workforce now that you don't see them anymore, now that they don't mm-hmm. have those touch points mm-hmm. with their colleagues at the at the coffee shop or at the water cooler? What's happening to those people? So again, I think that we need to be even more involved in making sure that we have a healthy workforce and they have the supports and buffers that they need to be able to live a healthy life. It's, it's, it's even more challenging these days, I would say. Yeah. Yeah. Well said. And even yeah. even more salient to to uh, to make sure that we're mindful of that. Yeah. Yeah. No, that's great. Yeah, I totally agree with that. Absolutely. Let's transition a bit here. We've got a few minutes. Let's transition over to your experience at the White House. It's an interesting point of interest about you. It happened very recently. You've worked for two administrations to different political viewpoints. Can you obviously there's a lot that you can't talk about, but what, tell us a bit about that experience and what you learned from that and what you hope others would take away from that. Yeah. The, so for your listeners who, who don't know, the White House Medical Unit is not a secret entity. It's something that you can Google. And it's, it's manned by military healthcare professionals and support personnel. And I worked there. I was assigned there originally December of 2018. I did some education and training. I really started getting on the road if you will, in May of 2019. And I primarily supported the president, the vice president. And towards the end of my time at the White House Medical Unit in 2022, I was spending a lot of time with the first lady. 
what that looked like for me is either independently traveling with with the uh, with the principal at the time, and again, that can be the top three: the president, vice president, or first lady. Doing simultaneously simultaneous medical planning, contingency medical planning. What happens in a really bad day? What do we do to mitigate that from a medical standpoint? And I did that over two administrations. To be transparent, I worked from 18 to 22. So that was the Trump administration and the Biden administration. And seeing those two different political administrations come in in the executive branch and their two different approaches really did nothing for me as a professional, because as a military member, one, we're apolitical, two, the job stays the same. And so it's make sure we have continuity of government. If there's ever a medical emergency, make sure you have the skills, knowledge, expertise, and supports to be able to mitigate that. And that's what we did. And I did that uh, traveling all around the world, supporting those three principles, had a great time doing it. And it was uh, it was interesting because I will tell you that it, I was there during two significant inflection points in our country's history. One, COVID-19, and and two, a lot of the racial unrest that was occurring on the heels of the murder of George Floyd and others. And those two periods, I would say, rival, if not maybe even exceed, like the attacks on our nation's capital, 9-11, because there was such a global impact to that that we still feel even today. Wow. Talk to us a bit about some of the highlights, like the moments that you can share that were either public or not so public, things that you can share openly without incriminating anyone. Yeah, no. (laughs) I want to hear some cool stories, man. (laughs) Bring us to those moments. Looking for all my classified documents here. Sorry. Exactly. (laughs) You better not have Um, any classified documents at your house. You're in trouble. (laughs) Right. No, I I would say that we, our work was really, there was not a whole lot of grandiosity in the work. We were anywhere you saw the principal, president, vice president, or first lady, we were there. Day or night, didn't matter. And someone was always there. During all the interesting times, someone, Jan- I'm thinking of January 6th. I'm thinking of all these interesting times in our recent history. We were always there. But it was one of those things that our job was really to, to, stay, to stay out of the camera, to stay out of the limelight, but to always, to always be there. And the glorification of the job is really hard, to, really hard to quantify because at a certain point, you're much like Secret Service in a lot of ways where your job is really just to be of service to to the office of the president and the vice president. Did I have some interesting experiences? I think we all do, but again. (laughs) I I just think of like (laughs) Forrest Gump. You're literally Forrest Gump running around. I can't believe I'm here doing this. And it seems just outside the context of normal. And it's like a dream, I would imagine, being here, seeing history unfold. It is outside of the context. It's interesting. We have these experiences in life, whatever they may be. Some people may end up coming into a lot of money. And we always imagine, I wonder what that would feel like. But at a certain point, it all feels pretty normal. I remember one day thinking, I really don't want to go to work tomorrow. (laughs) (laughs) I don't want to go. And and, But I had a good friend that always told me, listen, literally go to the Rose Garden and pinch yourself. Because you're working at the, the, at the most powerful place in the entire world, working for the most powerful human, literally, in the entire world. It becomes so ordinary after a certain point that you have to remind yourself that you're blessed. You have to remind yourself that you're favored. You have to remind yourself that at some point, all this goes away. Let's be clear. If I wanted to go across the uh, the gates at the White House, Secret Service will tackle me at this point, too. I don't have that access anymore. <laughs> Put that to the test. <laughs> You're right. I started to realize at a certain point, wow, I have to remind myself, I, I'm so lucky, highly favored. And just to be able to be a part of that and to be a, a part of an organization where, geez, you have the best of the best. You have the best people. No one's self-serving. And I think that's one of the things that we look for when we recruit our own is we look for people who are very humble, for people who will sweep the floor. And we did it all. We did everything that maybe an executive would never find themselves doing or even imagine themselves doing, all the way up to having, without, with having discretion, some of the most profound responsibilities one hmm. could ever imagine having. Yeah, yeah, And being able to work within both sides of that bell curve, to be the mm-hmm. person that does the scut work, but then also mm-hmm. the person that's really the confidant of our nation's leaders yeah. is pretty profound. That is really profound. Yeah, yeah. That's an extraordinary experience. Yeah, thank you for sharing that. That's really cool. 
It's wonderful, that, that kind of insight. In each of us, in our careers, we have those moments, whether you're in entertainment, you're, maybe you're just a famous actor, and you get the, these moments on the red carpet, but the real work is on a set where you're like alone for a lot of hours sitting in a trailer, and that, that limelight lasts very fleeting. And you don't know if your career is going to continue or not. There's a lot of A-list actors that have gone by the wayside because, for whatever reason, the crowd is no longer interested in watching them or they've had some, some bad films. And those in, in, in medicine and in law, and you have your moment in the sun if you're lucky, but it's a moment in the sun and that time goes away. It's very fleeting. So yeah, it reminds me of artists like Taylor Swift, who she's at the pinnacle of her career right now. In fact, I heard that she gave $100,000 to each of her workers. I don't know if you've heard this wow. story. Yeah. Each of them, all the way down to the person on the lowest part of her totem pole, $100,000 bonus on top of the salary that they're making. Super giving, super brilliant person, incredibly talented artist. And we're watching her career unfold. She's at the pinnacle of her career. But fast forward 30 years from now, right? 40 years from now, this moment will have passed. And it probably won't matter much at all to those of us in that time when we're 40, 50, 60 years, 100 years, all of us will have been forgotten. So this idea yeah. that, that we're going to leave legacy, we, yes, we should try this podcast right. is a part of that for me. It's okay. People can look back at this, but in a hundred years, are people really going to want to watch this? Probably not. Probably not. If the internet exists, <laughs> I don't yeah. know what this will look like, but for now, it's serving a cool purpose. So this idea of fleeting, the greatness fleets. So the moments in between are what matter the most, really. The moment that we're experiencing right now. Let's talk a bit about that. It's a bit existential, but let's try to break that down if we can and why it's important to think of, it, of life in that way. Going back to my experience at the White House, without saying her name, there was a woman, a janitor, custodian rather, who, who cleaned our offices. And, and she did it with pride. She was so proud of her work. I got to know her. Her son was a, sol a soldier. He was stationed at Schofield Barracks in Hawaii. And at a certain point, I started to realize, one, everyone is human. President's human, the vice president's human. The COVID nineteen pandemic was the great equalizer that you saw. You saw everyone have a sense of humility in certain instances, fear, and it was the great equalizer to to let you know to remind me that we're all human, irrespective of what our positions are. But I'll tell you that lady, and I won't say her name. I still remember her because huh. that woman took she took so much pride in the work that she did. No one will ever know her. No one will ever see her on a camera. But her answers to some of the questions that I would, I would ask of her, I would say, how long have you been doing this? And she had done it for 10 plus years. And she said, I'm just so proud to come here and make this place look special for you. Wow. Wow. <laughs> I mean, just you and you. And so I took that moment and I got into a presidential motorcade and that made that motorcade not feel so magical. Hmm. What felt magical was that mo was that moment with someone who took so much pride in taking out the trash, um, hmm. wiping down. You know, even when I said, "No, we don't need we don't need the floors <laughs> vacuumed. There's no crumbs here." But she said, "No, I need to do this." And yeah. so it's people like that I remember actually more than the cabinet members, than the people that I, in many ways, enamored because of who they are and what they did. But I still remember those conversations with our custodian because those were the most important conversations that I had at the White House. It's mind boggling to even think of it that way, particularly considering the fact that as we were going through the COVID-19 pandemic, we were bringing in every single CEO of every single industry, the hospitality industry, the hotel industry, the, every industry possible, because it was a whole of government, a whole of society approach mm. to mitigate the effects of this global pandemic. So I shared the room of very, very high profile people outside of the government in their private spaces, CEOs of grocery stores and things like that. Just everyone. But that custodian, hmm. those conversations were the most important and resonated with me the most because those are the people who, who make this world the place that, that we enjoy. Those are the people who never really, they're unsung heroes in a lot of ways. But where will we be without them? And so Absolutely. I remember her wholeheartedly. And so th those are the conversations that I miss the most. Wow. That's beautiful. Yeah, that's, that's, it is amazing. It's really profound to think of life in that way. And that's the vast majority of us as humans and it taking is. pride in whatever it is that we do, wherever we are, whatever station in life we may find ourselves in. 
that job is no less important than being the president of the United States. And to have that, to see her put that kind of pride into the work at hand, you're right. It's, it's profound. It's really beautiful. Yeah. And it's interesting. She was, again, not to say her name, but she always came in at the very end of the day. And so that, that was honestly part of, usually the best part of my day. It was very refreshing. I just feel, I always feel more in touch with people who are, who are humble, Mm -hmm. who don't have this predisposition, who are not entitled, but in the same breath, they do whatever they do with so much pride and love that it makes you question your own motivations at some point. And and that's what I found myself doing. Am I really that important or am I just telling myself that to make myself feel better? Because if I can walk around with the level of humility that she has, I think that's what success looks like for me. Yeah. Wow. That's beautiful. Yeah. Yeah. You're absolutely right. I think that's a good note to end on. Yeah. Is there anything else that uh, you want to share with us in these last few moments that we can take away? Thank you. I really appreciate the opportunity for sitting down with you. I consider you a friend at this point. Lift as you climb. I'm around a lot of people who are in very prestigious positions, have very storied histories, a pedigree that's untouchable in a lot of ways, but it gets lonely at the top. And I think that we want to have the people that we love around us and we want to be able to lift people up. If I can say anything that anyone remembers from this entire podcast, if you remember nothing, to lift as you climb. And if you can do that, I think that's what success looks like for me. That's awesome. Thank you so much, Tony, for spending time with us today. I think our audience will come away with a lot having seen this and heard your words of wisdom. You're a dear friend. I appreciate it so much. All right. I think that's enough for today. All right. Thank you. Thank you for having me, brother. Take care, my friend. All right. We'll see you.